having us on the program. It's exciting to, uh, to share our research to this audience. Uh, so in this picture, we try to incorporate the psychological cost of financial constraints, which I think is the core agenda of this conference to the standard framework. E economists think about the cost of financial constraints. So it's well known that the psychological cost of financial constraints are very crucial to understanding poverty in development economics. It's also well known that the US households are very severely financially constrained and every year financial stress is the number one stress in America. So in, in some sense, this is very surprising that th this notion of financial stress of a psychological cost of financial constraints is completely out of the picture of household finance and macroeconomics, which is a field we are in. So in this paper, we try to kind of bridge this gap and we try to provide a link to link this behavioral takes, psychological takes of financial constraints in a traditional framework that the traditional economists think about the cost of financial constraints. So in particular, why I mean this traditional take on financial constraints is this financial constraints leads to imperfect consumption smoothing and constraints on portfolio choices. Well, on the behavioral side, I mean the financial constraints can uh, drain scarce cognitive resources and performance and economic task deteriorates. For example, the notion of scarcity by, uh, by Mulanesa and Schaefer. So our contribution are two fourths. So we first run a kind of a large scale online survey in America to document that financial stress is a pretty prevalent thing in the United States. And then we try to build a kind of a tractable intertemporal consumption and saving model. Uh, or, incorporating financial stress and scarcity. So we can talk about you know, consumption, saving decisions, labor supply, and wealth distribution. So we start this paper with a, a large online US survey with 10,000 households, representative in terms of gender, age, region, uh, total, household income, uh, total household income, and education. So we, we find that the US households are financially stressed and so one of the kind of contributions, we, we kind of document this uh, based on different quantitative measures. For example, one question we ask is the amount of hours per week a participant spend worrying or dealing with financial stress and the median is six hours per week, which is pretty high. And also the, this number is not like a, just a high number for everyone. It actually uh, differs very uh, uh, largely across different groups. So in particular, we find uh, all measures of financial stress is strongly correlated with distance from financial constraints. So basically financial constraint households report a high number and not financially constrained households report a low number for different measures. And the bulk of the contribution was try to kind of a, bring in this notion of financial stress or scarcity into an otherwise standard intertemporal model to think about the consumption, saving, labor supply. And so this model have kind of a three key features motivated by the experimental evidence and survey evidence. So first, the financial stress drains valuable time and cognitive resources. So this follows this notion of scarcity that if a household is close to financial constraints and they are worrying about it and this drains valuable cognitive resources. And the second thing is consistent with our survey evidence and other experimental evidence, financial stress decreases with the distance to the financial constraints. And we also allow the household's degree of sophistication versus naivety about financial stress to vary. So sophistication versus naivety is a key concept in behavioral economics. So in this context, it means sophistication means the households understand that the financial stress is gonna uh, uh, drain valuable time and cognitive resources. So it has negative economic consequences, but naive households, they don't understand this. And we discipline our model based on our survey and experimental evidence, for example, through Pritt's work. And so, uh, so our key finding is actually if you allow this kind of uh, intertemporal consumption saving models, actually, if you want to have a psychological theory of poverty trap, you actually need two elements. So the financial stress or scarcity itself is not enough. You need this together with naivety. So the intuition is sophisticates who understand that this financial stress gonna uh, crowds out valuable cognitive resources. 
So you're gonna have an extra saving motive because they understand this inc increased saving gonna alleviate financial stress and it's gonna kind of basically uh, attenuate the negative economic consequence of financial stress. So they have a very high saving motive. They actually gonna save out of the financial stress region. They will not be financially stressed in equilibrium. On the other hand, naives, they don't fully understand the negative economic consequence of financial stress. So they did save and they're gonna fall into a poverty trap and incur a high welfare losses. And it's the second finding we have is actually the, the, this introduction of the financial stress and scarcity can also help resolve another uh, kind of a, a puzzle in traditional economics model, which is this negative wealth effect of labor supply. So what does this mean? So in a standard economics model, you have this channel, if I give you more money and you're gonna demand more leisure. Leisure is kind of a normal good. So if you become richer, you want to relax more, have more entertainment instead of work more. So, uh, so basically this means more money means you're gonna have a lower labor, labor supply. So this is a negative wealth effect of labor supply. So this is counterfactual inconsistent with a lot of uh, empirical evidence which either find small, close to zero, or sometimes even positive wealth effect of labor supply in developing countries. So introducing this financial stress uh, motive can basically reverse this negative wealth effect of labor supply. The intuition is if the household has more money, they're gonna be less financially stressed. So this is gonna freeze up time and cognitive resources for productive work. And this can kind of reverses the negative wealth effect of labor supply. And we'll also briefly talk about the implications for the wealth inequality and fiscal multipliers. So we start our paper with kind of a large online US survey. We work with a survey company called Dynata. And so it targets 10,000 prime age employed US workers, representative in terms of gender, age, region, total household income, and education. So we start with the qualitative question. So basically, it's basically uh, on a scale of one to 10, how concerned you are about your financial situation. So uh, not surprisingly, the majority of the Americans, they, they, they do feel somewhat concerned. For example, the media is six. And then we kind of develop a little bit more kind of qualitative measures about the economic consequence of financial stress. So we start with just the standard questions about how many hours do you work typically? So the media is 40. And the second question is inspired by a lot of works uh, done by people in this room about the negative economic consequence of financial stress and scarcity in developing countries. And here, the way we ask is over the past week, how many working hours were you distracted by your financial concerns? And the median is five. And the third question we ask is more like a little bit like a time use survey question. It's a more broader question of capturing kind of the, uh, the, 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 the amount of time households spend thinking about and dealing with issues related to household finance. And the median is six. And this kind of pretty high number in terms of this time use question is also consistent uh, with a few work, for example, Lusardi, who is an expert in financial literacy, uh, what she finds in her surveys. And we also kind of ask a kind of another dimension this financial stress may have economic consequence, which is this notion of impulse spending that has been uh, written in a lot of personal finance book, which is basically you may spend some um, money, either shopping or alcohol or uh, uh, cigarettes, stuff like that to relieve financial stress. And the median is $100 per week. And also it's, it's not the answer, it's like a, just a high number for everyone. Actually, a, a, a key finding we have is the financial stress, no matter whatever measure we use, it actually differs a lot by measures of financial constraints. So we, for example, we ask a kind of a standard survey question to gauge a person's financial constraint status, which is basically if your household experienced an unexpected emergency, would you be able to cover a $2,000 expense? And we divide the households into two, three categories, cannot pay, need to borrow, and no need to borrow. And we find all measures of financial stress gonna dif differ very significantly across all these three different categories of the financial constraint status. 
So then we basically try to develop a kind of a tractable intertemporal model of financial stress, which is basically the standard intertemporal model with financial constraints that uh, economists talk about the consequence of financial constraints. But we just did one twist, which is add this financial stress and scarcity channel. And so we are basic, basically able to talk both financial stress and scarcity, but also within the standard framework that economics economists think about the consumption, saving, and labor supply. So before going to the mess, let me briefly mention the key elements. So the, there are three key elements. So one is financial stress drains the value and cognitive resources. So you can think about each household that have like a time or cognition budget. And this financial stress is gonna drain valuable time or cognition uh, resources in this time or cognition budgets. And the second thing, which is consistent with our survey evidence and lots of experimental evidence, that financial stress is gonna decrease with the distance from financial constraints. So if you are more financial constrained and this financial stress channel gonna uh, drain more cognitive and time resources. And we also allow the household's degree and degrees of sophistication versus naivety about financial stress to vary. So it's kind of the, the sophisticated means the households understand the negative economic consequence of financial stress in terms of crowding out time and cognitive resources. And we're gonna also one of the key finding is this notion of sophistication and naivety gonna be actually crucial in determining whether you're gonna fall into a poverty trap or not. So in particular, so this is basically the standard intertemporal consumption and saving model with one twist. So here the theta A basically captures how much the financial stress crowds out time and cognition available for labor supply. So in, in the standard economics model, it's typically kind of you have like a time or cognition uh, budget, you can choose uh, to kind of work or you can choose for leisure. So here the financial stress is gonna kind of crowd out your time or cognition budget. So this basically kind of crowds out the valuable time or cognition available for productive labor supply. So in our baseline model, this financial stress decreases with the net assets. So if you are richer, you are less financially stressed. And this financial stress function is exogenous. So this captures this view called involuntary capture of attention in the scarcity literature. So it's basically the idea is if you are close to the financial constraints, you cannot stop worrying about it. But we also show that in a model in which the households can endogenously choose how much they spend time, try to alleviate the financial stress, the results gonna be basically the same. And so the baseline model was designed to speak to the uh, empirical evidence on uh, the, 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 financial, the, the impact of financial stress on labor decisions on productivity. And so this is the reason why I do this way is this is kind of one of the most documented channel in development economics. For example, in Supritz and her co-authors paper, they vary the time of wage payments. So some are paid earlier and some are paid later and they document the productivity and earning loss of the later, of the later group due to the financial stress. And this is also consistent with our survey evidence. Also, you may, so we, we choose kind of an additive functional form because we want to capture this idea of attention or kind of a time budget, but the functional form is not really important. We also work with multiplicative productivity loss and the result uh, also goes through. And also here we focus on the impact on labor, productivity, earnings, uh, but actually the same modeling uh, techniques can be uh, applied to other, potential channels of financial stress. For example, it may have direct utility costs. It may have impact in your economic decisions. In particular, for example, your, the, the, the quality of your portfolio allocation, the return on your savings, or it may generate impulse spending. So we have a few additional exercises in the paper along different channels of financial stress. And so the rest of the model is the textbook model of to think about consumption, saving, labor supply, and uh, wealth distribution. So the household is subject to a financial constraints. They have a boring constraint. So there, there's a lower bound in their net assets. And there is an idiosyncratic productivity shock. So some households are uh, high productivity and some households are low productivity. And this is gonna generate a, a well-defined wealth distribution. So you can talk about, uh, for example, wealth inequality. And so 
our one of kind of our key kind of exercise is we are able to vary the degree of sophistication and naivety about financial stress. So the notion of sophistic sophistication is that these households they understand that financial stress are uh, gonna crowd out valuable cognitive and time resources. So you have negative economic consequence in terms of you know earnings or productivity, and this gonna generate. Uh, additional channel, which is additional saving motive beyond the standard intertemporal substitution motive, which is this extra saving motive to save out of the financial stress. So the sophisticates, they understand if they try a little bit harder to save a little bit more today and their future financial, financial stress gonna be alleviated. And so this gonna alleviate the negative economic consequence of financial stress. So they have this additional saving motive and it actually turns out to be quite strong. And actually we're gonna show in our calibration actually quite robust finding that for sophisticates, they're gonna save all of the financial stress and there is no poverty trap. And then we're gonna to turn to the naivety case, which is actually have two equivalent, equivalent interpretation in this framework. So why is they just don't understand the lower saving leads to lower stress. So they don't understand that there is a connection between saving and the stress or oh, even they understand this, they just don't understand that the, the financial stress gonna have negative consequence on productivity, earnings, or you know, uh, uh, this economic consequence. And so because the households are naive about this, they don't have this extra saving motive. So the saving motive uh, to save all of the financial stress region disappear here. Instead, they actually have a lower net saving compared to the no stress households. This is just a direct negative effect of financial stress because financial stress crowds out your cognition or time available for labor supply. And so this means gonna, you're going to have a lower earnings and this is going to uh, uh, kind of decrease your net savings. And you're going to see this is going to lead to lower net savings and uh, 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 households trapped in the poverty trap in our uh, calibration. And so in terms of calibration, so we need to kind of kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, decide about which is basically how the financial stress vary based on uh, the distance from financial constraints. So exact functional form does not seem to be very important, but we choose ex exponential functional form as a baseline analysis. And we kind of calibrate this functional form in three different ways. So the first uh, way is we have some additional questions. It's kind of a hypothetical question uh, within subject variations, basically some hypothetical questions about the, uh, what happens if you are at financial constraints or what happens if I give you a stimulus check like $2,000, will this affect your uh, uh, financial uh, stress consequences? This is the first way to calibrate the model. The second way to calibrate the model is we use kind of the cross subject variation between financial stress and the distance from the financial constraint. And the third way we calibrate the model is we directly match the uh, experimental evidence by Supreet and her causes. Uh, in, 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 so, so all the calibrations gonna lead to pretty similar results. And the rest of the parameters are similar to the standard uh, uh, macroeconomics analysis. So here are the main results. So let me just familiarize with this graph. So this is basically uh, how the net saving, so the y-axis is the net saving and the x-axis is the household's wealth level. And so we have basically two, two kind of individual households productivity states, which is kind of high productivity households and low productivity households. And the blue line captures the net saving of the high productivity households. And so they have a positive net saving and the gray line captures the net saving of the low productivity households. So they have kind of a, a, a negative net saving. So this is the standard permanent income hypothesis. So if you are temporarily high productivity, you want to kind of uh, save in case that your, your, your income can go down in the future. And if you, have a, you are currently in a low income state, you try to de-save. So you, you kind of try to borrow against the future because this can help you uh, consumption suits. So here is kind of our main results. So we start with the case of financial uh, stress but with sophistication. So the households, they understand that this financial stress is gonna crowd out uh, their kind of 
cognition and time resources. So they have this additional saving motive. So you can see kind of no matter the idiosyncratic income state, so households gonna have a much higher kind of net saving. So this extra saving motive turns out to be very large uh, in equilibrium. So it seems that actually uh, for, for households across uh, their wealth level, their income level, it seems that their saving gonna be higher than the case without financial stress. And in particular for households around the financial constraints, so around like the A lower bar, which is borrowing constraints, the, there is actually a positive net saving. So if you are close to the borrowing constraints, your net saving is positive, and this is gonna help you to save out of the borrowing constraints. So in this, this sense, there is no poverty trap, and this uh, extra saving constraint, extra saving motive to save out of financial stress is strong. And here, because for the households close to the financial constraints, they have like this positive net savings. So if you look at the stationary wealth distribution, no households are actually exactly at the borrowing constraints. So for the households close to the borrowing constraints, they're gonna just have a positive net saving. So in the stationary wealth distribution, everyone gonna save out of the, the financial constraint region. So in this sense, this kind of sophisticated case is actually counterfactual because it's inconsistent with lots of evidence that lots of households are financially stressed or are financially constrained. So then we turn to the naivety case, which can help explain the poverty trap and generate this type of evidence. Um, so for the naivety case, they don't have the extra saving motive. Instead, they have this direct effect of financial stress on their earnings because financial stress crowds out valuable cognitive resources for, for, for working. And so, so, so you basically see their net saving gonna be lower to the case of without financial stress because their earnings are lower because of the financial stress. And this gonna lead to kind of more households at financial constraints uh, uh, in a stationary wealth distribution because households here, they have a lower net saving. And so that's why they fall into the poverty trap. For example, introduce this type of naive households can significantly increase the amount of households in financial constraints and actually uh, close to the empirical evidence about the, the, the amount of households uh, exactly as the financial constraints. And we also can consider a calibration with kind of a mixture of naive and uh, sophisticated households. And so not surprisingly, based on the previous results, so we can still have quite a large number of households at the financial constraints, but those households are all naive households. Instead of all the sophisticated households, they're gonna save out of the financial constraint region. And this does not depend on how we calibrate the proportion of sophisticated households. And so we do quite a lot of like robustness checks or extensions about the functional forms, about financial stress, about how exactly uh, financial stress affects your kind of uh, economic problems. So, and we also uh, study alternative channels of financial stress. For example, this notion of stress or impulse spending, or kind of we, uh, we can allow the financial stress affects your kind of job transition probability, et cetera, it does not affect the result. So now in the <coughs> final few minutes, we're gonna talk about a few additional predictions that we get from the model. So one additional prediction is on this impact on the wealth effect of labor supply. So in a baseline kind of uh, economics model, it always have this somewhat puzzling prediction that if the households <coughs> receive, for example, a cash transfer, they're gonna work less. And this is just because leisure is a normal goods. If the household is richer and they're gonna want to enjoy more leisure, which means you work less. And this is kind of uh, inconsistent with lots of empirical evidence. I think in the uh, developed countries, the evidence is basically close to zero. And in developing countries, there's a lot of evidence that actually for the cash transfer program actually in increase kind of uh, labor productivity or earnings. So introduce this financial stress channel can generate a positive wealth effect of labor supply, especially close to the financial constraints. So the intuition is basically uh, by giving you more money, this gonna relieve financial stress and frees up more time and cognitive resources for productive work. So this can increase your productive labor supply. And so this effect are gonna be actually particularly pronounced 
close to your financial constraints because when you are close to the financial constraints, this financial stress channel matters a lot. So actually, when you're close to the financial constraints, you can see there is a positive wealth effect of labor supply. However, on the kind of when you are far away from the financial constraints, when the financial stress channel does not really matter, and so 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 this channel the, the traditional channel going to dominate. And actually, interestingly, this kind of effect on labor supply can also help us understand more about, for example, the stimulus checks, the fiscal stimulus payment uh, in 2021 for the pandemic. So in fact, in the White House speech, Biden's speech, actually, he explicitly mentioned that actually the, the, one of the functions of the stimulus check is for the households to alleviate their financial stress and they can focus on what they uh, typically focus on. So here the fiscal transfers can relieve the financial stress and increase labor supply and they can actually kind of search for their job harder and this can boost aggregate output. And so then finally, we also talk about the welfare cost of financial stress. So we develop a money centric measure of the welfare cost of financial stress, which is basically the transfer needed to compensate the households for the impact of financial stress. So we find this additional channel of financial stress is very costly for naive households, but not so much for the sophisticated households. This is because for the sophisticated households, they're gonna eventually save out of the financial stress region. So the impact of financial stress for them is temporary. But for the naive households, they're gonna effectively be permanently trapped. So you have like a permanent effect. So the welfare cost for those sophisticated and naive is gonna differ quite a lot. And the welfare costs for naives are quite large. So in summary, so what do we try to do is to kind of bring this uh, financial stress or scarcity into kind of the standard framework macroeconomists and financial economists think about the consumption and saving decisions and to evaluate the consequence of financial constraints. And we provide also survey evidence that the financial stress is a very prevalent factor in US households uh, uh, financial life. And in terms of implication, we show a psychological base, the theory of poverty trap will require both financial stress and naivety. And it can also reverse this counterfactual negative wealth effect, effect of labor supply, can increase the welfare cost of financial constraints and have no trivial macroeconomic consequences on wealth inequality and fiscal multipliers. Thank you. We'll open it up for Q&A. Thanks, Tim, that, that was great. Uh, so in your model, a critical role is played by the naivety and sophistication. And, and you, know, you were showing us how uh, fitting the fact that many households in the US are in fact financially constrained, it, it therefore, in your model, must be that people are kind of naive. But isn't there a tension between that and the survey evidence? Because in fact, one of your survey questions was explicitly counterfactual. It was how many, how much money do you kind of wastefully in a way spend in a week, which you wouldn't if you weren't financially stressed? And in fact, people said an enormous number, a hundred dollars a week, which you know, must, in some sense must be almost too much, but. Uh, so wouldn't that suggest that in fact there is at least some degree of sophistication and how should we then, you know, how can we resolve that tension or you know, is, is it that there's other things like I have a self-control problems or yeah, so this is an amazing question. So actually this notion of sophistication and naivety we borrow from the present bias literature in the sense you are actually, you understand the current impact of financial stress. So even for the naive households, they understand there is a current impact of uh, financial stress. So this is consistent with the survey evidence, which is about the current impact. And the thing that's naive about is about the future impact. So there's kind of a transition propensity of the current self to the future self. And what you are naive about is the financial stress consequence on your future self's consequences. And so that's why the key margin that this naive, uh, naivety versus sophistication that matters is saving. And because saving decisions actually depends on kind of the sophistication and naivety about kind of the future uh, financial stress. So that's why the, for the saving decision, we think it's naivety and sophistication about future financial stress is the one that matters. Um, 
yeah, question that, and I, I like Gautam said, I realize it's sort of an academic and sophistication is deep here, but is there an argument, you know, that this naivete and this sophistication itself is potentially endogenous? Uh, or I don't know that it will make it too complicated to solve the model if you if you did that, but is there a loop here potentially in, in as much as, you know, uh, when you're stressed, then it's sort of clouding your, your thinking and the choices that you make are not very uh, clear headed, quote unquote, rational. So that is the good that then sort of increase your propensity to be more naive um, or myopic in some sense in terms of what the, that you say, you know, thinking about what the future consequences will be. I don't know how that would fit with the data. Yeah, so I'm actually very sympathetic to this. Uh, so, so, so the idea is basically if you are more financial stress and it crowds out your cognition and make it basically more naive. So I, I don't know kind of exactly way how to do this because it's kind of, I actually never seen even in the present bias literature a very kind of a successful way about endogenize the sophistication and naivety. But we did something a little bit along this dimension, not exactly this, this dimension, which is, for example, in one of the extension, we let this financial stress affect the, your return on your portfolios. So it's basically, basically the idea is you are financially stressed, you cannot kind of choose your portfolio decisions kind of correctly. So you invest in the wrong stocks or you make the wrong uh, allocation between kind of uh, uh, saving a bank or saving the stock. And there is evidence that in, for example, Scandinavian countries and the US, it seems to be the case that the households return on their portfolio uh, increase quite a lot based on their asset level. So basically for households who are hand to mouth or close to financial constraints, they, their, their return on their portfolio is much lower than the re richer households. And so we, we actually have one calibration in which we allow this effect of financial stress affect the return on portfolios. And that seems to have basically similar results as what we had here basically is because if you are stressed and then your return on portfolio is low and you are trapped and if you are, if you kind of uh, you're away from that regions and then your return on portfolio is higher and then that gets you out of the poverty trap. Right, right. I have a suggestion. I think you, you can, there's a, I can see a very straightforward extension of the model that would generate a poverty trap for sophisticates in, in, in certain circumstances. Is if you allow them to go, I think, below a bar, so then, and it might be that the, the, the stress is maxed out, so they must max out the stress. So now they are below a bar, they have to save to get to a bar. But while they're doing that, it doesn't reduce their stress. So, so it's like accumulating to buy a, 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 lump, a lump sum investment. You know that you are, you, you say, oh, you just go like, oh, it's going to be too long, it's going to be too hard. I'm just going to give up. So we actually have some extensions along this line. So for example, one potential thing that can capture this idea is basically you have this non-convex stress function. It's basically you need to kind of uh, uh, spend quite a lot, save quite a lot to get you all of the stress. So basically here's kind of a stress function. So like a, when you're close to financial constraints, no matter how much you're saved, it will not affect your stress that much. Only like you have like a threshold and you go there and then you can, uh, you, you, so, so, so you can get off the financial stress region. And interestingly, even for this case, it still has a prediction that the sophisticated is gonna save out of the financial stress region. And actually to break this, actually this is gonna go back to some old work by Gaylor in, in Brown University, you need both this Together with a discrete technology, so you need a kind of a kind of a kind of a, you you either try to kind of a, do the human capital investment or you choose to not do the human capital investment, but that has like a fixed cost. That's like a fixed that has a fixed cost, and that's like a discrete decision. So, but here the because the consumption and saving decision is kind of a continuous decision. So what we we find is even you have this non convex stress function that you need to do quite a lot. If you have a continuous decision, the sophisticated is still gonna save out of that region. So only you need this together with kind of a discrete decision, and that can that is the way to get sophisticates to be trapped into the financial stress region. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we're going to have to cut it there, but thank you, Chen.